David Bowie. Uh, he was walking by me at a festival that he was headlining. We were the opening band, no one saw us. He's walking by, and like a lot of people, I love David Bowie, those records. I was on the treadmill today at your local Planet Fitness, listening to Station to Station, ushering in the first day of November. And so I'm listening to that record, and I, I, I just love David Bowie records. They're just part of my DNA. I see him walking by me. I'm not stupid enough to run up to him and stick my hand and go like, hi, I'm Henry, to have him tell me to go piss up the proverbial rope, because that'll like ruin my rock fantasy. So I'm gonna let him go in case he's not a very nice guy. At least I have the records and the t-shirts and the personality posters, which yes, I do have framed on my wall. And so he walks by me going from my right to my left, and I'm standing there completely silently cataloging him. Hair, perfect. Clothes, perfect. Shoes, perfect. Good posture. He wears it well. And I'm like, finally, a superstar I am taller than. Yes. And so he's walking by me, and he stops and looks at me, and he points at like, Rollins. I'm like, no. And I go <laughs> running at him with my hand extended like a lance. And I said, yo, David. And I shake hands with him, and I don't know what to say. I'm like, uh, I, I, what are you going to say to David freaking Bowie? And I'm like, I, yes. And he said, Henry, you said something in an interview in a magazine last month I found fascinating. And he proceeds to quote me back to me, like three parents. I'm like, sure sounds better coming out of your mouth. I said, you read an interview of mine? And he kind of like, Henry, I read all your interviews. You're a very interesting person. Now, last year in a German magazine, you said this, and he proceeds to quote me from a year ago in translation. I'm like, I, I can barely even speak English. Like, this guy is blowing my mind. He says, when does your next book come out? I'm like, do you know I write books? He goes, oh, I read a few of them. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> my life is not going to get any better than this moment. Like, give me some highway in a milk truck. Because, <clears throat> like, it, it's going to be downhill from there. And he looks at me. He's like, have you had lunch? And I said, no. He's walking towards the catering tent. That's why he's walking that away. And I'm just holding this miserable cup of coffee. And he goes, well, let's go have lunch. So I check my day planner. I'm good. Yeah. And so we go into the tent, and there's like 500 rock roadies in there eating sides of beef and drinking you know, uh, nectar from horns or whatever. And um, you know, big guys. And they all want to hear our conversation. So everyone's eating and listening. And he and I are at, at this table, just the two of us. And what made him so interesting was he dominated the conversation with questions. Henry, when was your last day off? Uh, three days ago in Amsterdam. Henry, Amsterdam, what a great city. Like, yeah, it is a great city. Henry, right down the street uh, on the lights of plane uh, near uh, the Rijksmuseum, there's this underground museum and they're having a Lithuanian dance troupe. You've got to go see him. Like, what, did you go see him on your day off? No, David, I don't know about underground Lithuanian dance troops. <laughs> Henry, I've seen them three times. They're really great. Like, okay, what record stores did you go to? I didn't go to a record store. I sat in my hotel room and ground my teeth. I'm you know, having a bad time on tour. Henry, you know, I, I know all the record stores in Amsterdam. Like, I, I've been to them a million times. He went to like four record stores that day. Have you ever been to the local art galleries there? Can't say I have, David. Oh, you really gotta go. There's one here, here. Like He went to like five galleries, two art museums, three bookstores, and three record stores on his day off. Like, what'd you do that night? I went to a Starbucks. I drank coffee and wrote in my journal. I go, oh, on my night off, I snuck into a club and DJed rave music until three in the morning. <laughs> What's the last five records you bought? I don't know, like, here's the last 50 I bought. Like, he's not bragging. He's just like, like, here's this. Like, have you ever been to a Moby show? Can't say I have. Oh, Henry, he's amazing. Okay, he's so switched on. Like, like he's seeing movies. He's going to on, on his nights off. He's going to see bands play. He's going to see dance troops. He like he goes he he goes to see painters. Like he wants to know what's going on. He's fascinated by what's going on in the world. A, he's David Bowie, and everywhere he goes, people faint. That's like David Bowie. The Queen wants to meet David Bowie. He doesn't have time. Uh, David Bowie is worth 150 <laughs> gajillion dollars. He doesn't have to move for anyone. He's already written half the great songs in rock and roll. Yet, he wants to know what's going on with the, the, the dummy from Black Flag. He wants to know about this, 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 and this. And like, I had some questions for him. Are you kidding? I've got questions for him all day. But he asked me too many questions. I didn't have time to answer, ask my questions because he's overloading me with questions. And so I'm just one guy. And so I, I, it was a great meeting that day because you realize you can be as famous as David Bowie, as rich as David Bowie, and your curiosity is an elective. Like, you can stay curious. You know, just because you're rich and famous doesn't mean like the world is boring now. Maybe the world is interesting because you say so. 
And that's what I got from David Bowie. Like it was this amazing 45 minutes of this guy who's like kind of plugged into an electrical switch. And you know, I try to remain curious. I'm 62, I'm reading books. I'm trying to know that everything is still interesting. I have a radio show, I'm buying records by people a fraction of my age because music is still good. And a lot of the inspiration for that curiosity that I have to work at on some days, I just don't want to know. I hear people in America say these awful things about gay people and trans people and, and black people and non-white people and women people. I'm like, ah, we're so screwed. And then I go, like, no, we're not, we're not. We're just in transition. Ancient pasty white men are gonna die. Young people are gonna take over. We're gonna be fine. And hopefully they'll still keep throwing oatmeal in my face and I can live uh, to fight another day. And so I, I try to remain curious, but I always remember David Bowie's like rabid curiosity and just this joy he seemed to have with being alive. And I, I, I don't know the guy. And uh, at one point I told him uh, that I was friends with the great writer Hubert Selby, who wrote the famous book, Last Six to Brooklyn. He goes, oh, I've read all his books. He's amazing. I go, yeah, no, he's a buddy of mine. He's a really great guy. And I just did an audio book for Hubert Selby of him reading Last Exit to Brooklyn in its entirety. And I know that Lou Reed loves Hubert Selby. He's like, oh yeah, Lou loves him. I said, yeah, you know Lou Reed. And so I want Lou Reed to put some interstitial guitar music on the Last Exit audio book. But I don't know how to meet Lou Reed because I'm just little old Henry Rollins. And David Bowie said, don't worry, I'll call Lou and have him call you. I'm like. That's a little bit too much proverbial smoke being blown only where Dr. Gold goes. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, sure you will. In my mind, I went, thanks, David. Like, that's going to happen. A few weeks later, I'm back in my tiny apartment in New York City, and I don't really know anybody. So if the phone rings, it's Heidi to yell at me or something. And so I pick up the phone. This is Henry. Hello, Henry. This is Lou Reed. David told me to call you. My knees go weak, and thankfully I'm sitting in a chair because Lou Reed is on my phone, and he's probably like 10 blocks from me. It's the Lower East Side. I'm like, hey, Lou, what's going on? And that's how I became friends with Lou Reed. And uh, we became pals all the way until his death. And he used to write me uh, complaining about his sore back and how he didn't like the bunks on tour buses. And his email address was sisray1, sister Ray, sisray1 at aol.com. And he would write me, I'm on a bus and my back really hurts. I'm like, Lou Reed is writing me about his sore back. And I'd write him back, sorry about your sore back, Lou. Lou Reed. And so when Lou Reed passed away, I woke up in bed, I looked at the internet, Lou Reed is gone. I had a radio show that night on my uh, radio show on KCRW. And I scrapped the entire show and we did it as a we're so sorry that Lou Reed has passed away show. And I went into the station to do it that night. And I played Lou Reed songs, Velvet Underground songs, bands covering uh, Lou Reed songs, even Iggy Pop doing a version of Waiting for the Man. So it's a really fun show saying goodbye to Lou and introducing people to his music. And then at some point I started reading his emails between songs. Like this is what he wrote, March whatever, 19 whatever it was. And uh, it became the fourth most downloaded show on KCRW that year. And I think it was the emails that really clinched the deal. But it was David Bowie who got me introduced to Lou Reed. And so uh, maybe that gift of inspiration is something that we can give to one another. You don't have to be a megastar like Lou Reed to light, or, 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 uh, or David Bowie to light someone up. You can just be a friend and go like, here's a book, here's a record. You look down on the mouth and it, come on, get in the car, we're going, we're gonna go to an art museum. I don't wanna go in, no, no, you're, you're coming with me. You're frowning too much. And we can be there for one another. And maybe we can be perpetual gift machines for each other. And maybe if we can take that into our daily idea of like that is one of the ways we should be existing, looking out for one another, we can somehow stand up to bad media, bad government, bad food, bad drugs, bad, 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 fake wars, and, and real death. And that's how we stand it down. And it comes from us wanting to be there for other people. And I'm not saying I learned that completely from David Bowie. I'm just saying it's moments like that, they start to add up and dots start to connect and you start to see a through line there where you can be inspiring to someone else and they can be inspiring to you. And you can be the battery that revs them up and they can be the battery that revs you up. And the more we get around each other and buzz like bees, uh, the more we get switched on and you can find out what to listen to, what to read, where to go. And maybe things don't have to be so miserable because we humans are, are single-handedly the creators of the great misery that's been perpetrated upon the earth. 